Section 14 of The Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The Aeneid by Virgil. Translated by J. W. McHale. Book 7 The Landing in Latium and the Roll of the Armies of Italy. Part 2. When their frenzy seemed heightened and her first task complete, the purpose in all the house of Latinus turned upside down, the dolorous goddess flies on thence, soaring on dusky wing to the walls of the gallant Rutulian, the city which Danae, they say, borne down on the boisterous south wind, built and planted with the Crisian's people. The place was called Ardia, once of old, and still Ardia remains a mighty name, but its fortune is no more. Here in his high house Turnus now took rest in the black midnight. Alecto puts off her grim feature in the body of a fury. She transforms her face to an aged woman's, and furrows her brow with ugly wrinkles. She puts on white tresses chaplet-bound, and entwines them with an olive spray. She becomes aged Caleb, priestess of Juno's temple, and presents herself before his eyes, uttering thus, Turnus, wilt thou brook all these toils poured out in vain, and the conveyance of thy crown to Dardanian settlers? The king denies thee thy bride, and the dower thy blood had earned, and a foreigner is sought for heir to the kingdom. Forth now, dupe, and face thankless perils. Forth, cut down the Tyrrhenian lines. Give the Latins peace in thy protection. This Saturn's omnipotent daughter in very presence commanded me to pronounce to thee as thou wert lying in the still night. Wherefore arise, and make ready with good cheer to arm thy people, and march through thy gates to battle. Consume those Phrygian captains that lie with their painted holes in the beautiful river. All the force of heaven orders thee on. Let King Latinus himself know of it, unless he consents to give thee thy bridle, and abide by his words when he shall at last make proof of Turnus's arms. But he, deriding her inspiration, with the words of his mouth, thus answers her again. The fleets ride on the Tiber wave. That news hath not, as thou deemest, escaped mine ears. Frame not such terrors before me. Neither is Queen Juno forgetful of us. But thee, O mother, overworn old age, exhausted and untrue, frets with vain distress, and amid embattled kings mocks thy presage with false dismay. Thy charge is to keep the divine image in temple. War and peace shall be in the hands of men and warriors. At such words Electo's wrath blazed out. But amid his utterance a quick shudder overruns his limbs. His eyes are fixed in horror, so thickly hiss the snakes of the fury, so vast her form expands. Then, rolling her fiery eyes, she thrust him back as he would stammer out more, raised two serpents in her hair, and, sounding her whip, resumed with furious tone, Behold me, the overworn, me whom old age, exhausted and untrue, mocks with false dismay amid embattled kings. Look on this! I am come from the home of the dread sisters. War and death are in my hand. So speaking, she hurled her torch at him, and pierced his breast with the lurid smoking brand. He breaks from sleep in overpowering fear, his limbs and body bathed in sweat that breaks out all over him. He shrieks madly for arms, searches for arms, on his bed and in his palace. The passion of the sword rages high, the accursed fury of war, and wrath over all. Even as when flaming sticks are heaped roaring loud under the sides of a seething cauldron, and the boiling water leaps up. The river of water within smokes furiously and swells high in overflowing foam, and now the wave contains itself no longer. The dark steam flies aloft. So, for the stain of the broken peace, he orders his chief warriors to march on King Latinus, and bids prepare for battle to defend Italy and drive the foe from their borders. Himself will suffice for Trojans and Latins together. When he uttered these words and called the gods to hear his vows, the Rutulians stir one another up to arms. One is moved by the splendor of his youthful beauty, one by his royal ancestry, another by the noble deeds of his hand. While Turnus fills the Rutulian minds with valor, Alecto, on Stygian wing, hastens towards the Trojans. With fresh wiles she marked the spot where beautiful Eulus was trapping and coursing game on the bank. Here the infernal maiden suddenly crosses his hounds with the maddening touch of a familiar scent and drives them hotly on the stag hunt. This was the source and spring of ill and kindled the country folk to war. The stag, beautiful and high antlered, was stolen from his mother's udder and bred by Tyreus's boys and their father Tyreus, master of the royal herds and ranger of the plain. Their sister Sylvia tamed him to her rule, and lavished her care on his adornment, twining his antlers with delicate garlands, and combed his wild coat and washed him in the clear spring. 
tame to her hand and familiar to his master's table he would wander the woods and however late the night return home to the door he knew far astray he floated idly down the stream and allayed his heat on the green bank when eulus's mad hounds started him in their hunting and ascanius himself kindled with desire of the chief honor aimed a shaft from his bended bow a present deity suffered not his hand to stray and the loud whistling reed came driven through his belly and flanks but the wounded beast fled within the familiar roof and crept moaning to the courtyard dabbled with blood and filling all the house with moans as of one beseeching sister sylvia smiting her arms with open hands begins to call for aid and gathers the hardy rustics with her cries they for a fell destroyer is hidden in the silent woodland are there before her expectation one armed with a stake hardened in the fire one with a heavy knotted trunk what each one searches and finds wrath turns into a weapon tyreus cheers on his array panting hard with his axe caught up in his hand as he was happily splitting an oaken log in four clefts with cross-driven wedges but the grim goddess seizing from her watch-tower the moment of mischief seeks the steep farm roof and sounds the pastoral war note from the ridge straining the infernal cry on her twisted horn it spread shuddering over all the woodland and echoed through the deep forests the lake of trivia heard it afar nar river heard it with white sulphurous water and the springs of valinus and fluttered mothers clasped their children to their breast then hurrying to the voice of the terrible trumpet note on all sides the wild rustics snatch their arms and stream in therewithal the men of troy pour out from their camp's open gates to succor ascanius the lines are ranged not now in rustic strife do they fight with hard trunks or burned stakes the two-edged steel sways the fight the broad cornfields bristle dark with drawn swords and brass flashes smitten by the sunlight and casts a gleam high into the cloudy air as when the wind begins to blow and the flood to whiten gradually the sea lifts his waves higher and yet higher then rises from the bottom right into the air here in the front rank young almo once tyreus's eldest son is struck down by a whistling arrow for the wound staying in his throat cut off blood and the moist voices passage and the thin life around many a one lies dead age galesus among them slain as he throws himself between them for a peacemaker once incomparable in justice and wealth of azonian fields for him five flocks bleated a fivefold herd returned from pasture and a hundred ploughs upturned the soil but while thus in even battle they fight on the broad plain the goddess her promise fulfilled when she hath dyed the war in blood and mingled death in the first encounter quits hesperia and glancing through the sky addresses juno in exultant tone lo discord is ripened at thy desire into baleful war tell them now to mix in amity and join alliance insomuch as i have imbued the trojans in ozonian blood this likewise will i add if i have assurance of thy will with my rumors I will sweep the bordering towns into war and kindle their spirit with furious desire for battle, that from all quarters help may come. I will sow the land with arms. Then Juno, answering, Terror and harm is wrought abundantly. The springs of war are aflow. They fight with arms in their grasp, the arms that chance first supplied, that fresh blood stains. Let this be the union, this the bridal, that Venus's illustrious progeny and Latinus the king shall celebrate. Our lord who reigns on Olympus's summit would not have thee stray too freely in heaven's upper air. Withdraw thy presence, whatsoever future remains in the struggle, that I myself will sway. Such accents uttered the daughter of Saturn, and the other raises her rustling snaky wings and darts away from the high upper air to Cocytus her home. There is a place midmost of Italy, deep in the hills, notable and famed of rumor in many a country, the Vale of Amsanctus. On either hand a wooded ridge, dark with thick foliage, hems it in, and midway a torrent and swirling eddies shivers and echoes over the rocks. Here is shown a ghastly pool, a breathing hole of the grim lord of hell, and a vast chasm breaking into Acheron yawns with pestilential throat. In it the fury sank, and relieved earth and heaven of her hateful influence but therewithal the queenly daughter of Saturn puts the last touch to war. The shepherds pour in full tale from the battlefield into the town, bearing back their slain, the boy Almo, in Galatius's disfigured face, and cry on the gods and call on Latinus. Turnus is there, and amid the heat and outcry at the slaughter redoubles his terrors, crying that Teucrians are bidden to the kingdom, that a Phrygian race is mingling its taint with theirs, and he is thrust out of their gates. They, too, the matrons of whose kin, struck by Bacchus, trample and choirs down the pathless woods, nor is Amata's name a little thing. They, too, gather together from all sides, and weary themselves with the battle-cry. 
omens and oracles of gods go down before them and all under malign influence clamor for awful war emulously they surround latinus's royal house he withstands even as a rock and ocean unremoved as a rock and ocean when the great crash comes down firm in its own mass among many waves slapping all about in vain the crags and boulders hiss round it in foam and the seaweed on its side is flung up and sucked away but when he may in no wise overbear their blind counsel and all goes at fierce juno's beck with many an appeal to gods and void sky alas he cries we are broken of fate and driven helpless in the storm with your very blood you will pay the price of this o wretched men thee o turnus thy crime thee thine awful punishment shall await too late wilt thou address to heaven thy prayers and supplication for my rest was won and my haven full at hand i am robbed but of a happy death and without further speech he shut himself in the palace and dropped the reins of the state there was a use in hesperian latium which the alban towns kept in holy observance now rome keeps the mistress of the world when they stir the war god to enter battle whether their hands prepare to carry war and weeping among gite or hyrcanians or arabs or to reach to india and pursue the dawn and reclaim their standards from the parthian there are twain gates of war so runs their name consecrate in grim mars's sanctity and terror a hundred bolts of brass and masses of everlasting iron shut them fast and janus the guardian never sets foot from their threshold there when the sentence of the fathers stands fixed for battle the consul arrayed in the robe of quirinus in the gabine cincture with his own hand unbars the grating doors with his own lips calls battle forth and then all the rest follow on and the brazen trumpets blare harsh with consenting breath with this use then likewise they bade latinus proclaim war on the aeneidae and unclose the baleful gates he withheld his hand and shrank away averse from the abhorred service and hid himself blindly in the dark then the saturnian queen of heaven glided from the sky with her own hand thrust open the lingering gates and swung sharply back on their hinges the iron-bound doors of war azonia is ablaze till then unstirred and immovable some make ready to march afoot over the plains some mounted on tall horses ride amain in clouds of dust all seek out arms and now they rub their shields smooth and make their spearheads glitter with fat lard and grind their axes on the whetstone rejoicingly they advance under their standards and hear the trumpet note five great cities set up the anvil and sharpen the sword strong atina and proud tiber ardia and crustumery and turreted antemne they hollow out headgear to guard them and plate wicker work round shield bosses others forge breastplates of brass or smooth greaves of flexible silver to this has come the honor of share and pruning hook to this all the love of the plough they retemper their father's swords in the furnace and now the trumpets blare the watchword for war passes along one snatches a helmet hurriedly from his house another backs his neighing horses into the yoke and arrays himself in shield and mail coat triple linked with gold and girds on his trusty sword open now the gates of helicon goddesses and stir the song of the kings that rose for war the array that followed each and filled the plains the men that even then blossomed the arms that blazed in italy the bountiful land for you remember divine ones and you can recall to us but a breath of rumor scant and slight is wafted down first from the tyrene coast savage mezentius scorner of the gods opens the war and arrays his columns by him is Lausus his son, unexcelled in bodily beauty, by any save Laurentine Turnus. Lausus, tamer of horses and destroyer of wild beasts, he leads a thousand men who followed him in vain from Agila town, worthy to be happier in ancestral rule, and to have other than Mezentius for father. After them the beautiful Aventinus, born of beautiful Hercules, displays on the sward his palm-covered chariot and victorious horses and carries on his shield his father's device the hundred snakes of the hydra's serpent wreath him in the wood of the hill aventine rhea the priestess bore by stealth into borders of light a woman mingled with a god and after the tyrinthian conqueror had slain gerion and set foot on the fields of laurentum and bathed his iberian oxen in the tuscan river these carry for war javelins and grim stabbing weapons and fight with the round shaft and sharp point of the sibelian pike himself he went on foot swathed in a vast lion skin shaggy with bristling terrors whose white teeth encircled his head and such wild dress the garb of hercules clasped over his shoulders he entered the royal house next twin brothers leave tiber town and the people called by their brother Tiberius's name catillus and valiant chorus the argives in advance in the forefront of battle among the throng of spears as when two cloud-born centaurs descend from a lofty mountain peak leaving homel or snowy othrys in rapid race 
the mighty forest yields before them as they go, and the crashing thickets give them way. Nor was the founder of Preneste City absent, the king who, as every age hath believed, was born of Vulcan among the pasturing herbs, and found beside the hearth Saeculus. On him a rusty battalion attends in loose order, they who dwell in steep Preneste, in the fields of Juno of Gabi, on the cool Anio, and the Hernican rocks, dewy with streams, they whom rich Ananya, in whom thou, Lord of Massinus, pasturest. Not all of them have armor, nor shields and clattering chariots. The most part shower bullets of dull lead, some wield in their hand two darts, and have for head covering caps of tawny wolf skin. Their left foot is bare wherewith to plant their steps. The other is covered with a boot of rawhide. But Mesippus, tamer of horses, the seed of Neptune, whom none might ever strike down with steel or fire, calls quickly to arms his long unstirred peoples, and bands disused to war, and again handles the sword. These are of the Fessonine ranks, and the Equifalisci, these of Seracte's fortresses, and the fields of Flavina, and Seminus's lake and hill, and the groves of Capena. They marched in even time, singing their king and whilom snowy swans among the thin clouds, when they return from pasturage, and utter resonant notes through their long necks. Far off echoes the river in the smitten Asian fen. Nor would one think these vast streaming masses were ranks clad in brass, rather that, high in air, a cloud of horse birds from the deep gulf was pressing to the shore. Lo, Clausus of the ancient Sabine blood, leading a great host, a great host himself, from whom now the Claudian tribe and family is spread abroad since Rome was shared with the Sabines. Alongside is the broad battalion of Amaternum and the old Latins, and all the force of Aretum and Mutuscan olive yards. They who dwell in Nomentum town in the Rosian country by Valinus, who keeps the crags of rough Tetrica and Mount Severus, Casperia and Feruli, and the river of Himela, they who drink of Tiber and Fabaris, they who cold Nursia hath sent, and the squadrons of Horta and the tribes of Latinium, and they whom Alia, the ill ominous name, servers with its current, as many of the waves that roll on the Libyan sea floor when the fierce Orion sets in the wintry surge, as thick as the ears that ripen in the morning sunlight on the plain of the Hermus or the yellowing Lycian tith. Their shields clatter, and earth is amazed under the trampling of their feet. Here Agamemnonian Halesus, foe of the Trojan name, yanks his chariot horses and draws a thousand warlike peoples to Turnus, those who turn with spades the mastic soil that is glad with wine, whom the elders of Arunca sent from their high hills, and the Cidicene low country hard by, and those who leave Callis, and the dweller by the shallows of the Volturnus River, and side by side the rough Seticulan and the Oscan bands. Polished maces are their weapons. In these it is their wont to fit with a tough thong. A target covers their left side, and for close fighting they have crooked swords. Nor shall thou, Ebalus, depart untold of in our verses, who wast born, men say, by the nymph Sabethus to Telon, when he grew old in rule over Capre, the Teleboic realm. But not so content with his ancestral fields, his son even held down in wide sway the Serastian peoples in the meadows watered by Sarnus, and the dwellers in Rufre and Batolum, in the fields of Selemne, and they on whom from her apple orchards a bella city looks down. Their wont was to hurl lances in Teutonic fashion. Their head covering was stripped bark of the cork tree, their shield plates glittering brass, glittering brass their sword. Thee too, Fens, mountainous nurse sent forth to battle of noble fame and prosperous arms, whose race on the stiff, aquiculan clods is rough beyond all other, and bred to continual hunting in the woodland. They till the soil in arms, and it is ever their delight to drive in fresh spoils and live on plunder. Furthermore there came, sent by King Archippus, the priest of the Meruvian people, dressed with prosperous olive leaves over his helmet, Umbro excellent in valor, who was wont with charm and touch to sprinkle slumberous dew on the viper's brood and water snakes of noisome breath. Yet he availed not to heal the stroke of the Dardanian spear-point, nor was the wound of him helped by his sleepy charms and herbs called on the massic hills thee the woodland of Angitia, thee Funicus's glassy wave, thee the clear pools wept. Likewise the seed of Hippolytus marched to war, Verbius most excellent in beauty, sent by his mother, Aricia. The groves of Egeria nursed him round the spongy shore where Diana's altar stands rich and gracious. For they saw in story that Hippolytus, after he fell by his stepmother's treachery, torn asunder by his frightened horses to fulfill the father's revenge, came again to the daylight in heaven's upper air, recalled by Diana's love and the drugs of the healer. 
then the lord omnipotent indignant that any mortal should rise from the nether shades to the light of life launched his thunder and hurled down to the stygian water the phoebus born the discoverer of such craft and cure but trivia the bountiful hides hippolytus in a secret habitation and sends him away to the nymphageria in the woodlands keeping where solitary in italian forests he should spend an inglorious life and have verbius for his altered name whence also hoofed horses are kept away from trivia's temple and consecrated groves because affrighted at the portents of the sea they overset the chariot and flung him out upon the shore notwithstanding did his son train his ruddy steeds on the level plain and sped charioted to war himself too among the foremost splendid in beauty of body turnus moves armed and towers a whole head over all his lofty helmet triple tressed with horsehair holds high a chimera breathing from her throat at neon fires raging the more and exasperate with baleful flames as the battle and bloodshed grow fiercer but on his polished shield was emblazoned in gold low with uplifted horns already a heifer and overgrown with hair a lofty design and argus the maiden's warder and lord inachus pouring his stream from his embossed urn behind comes a cloud of infantry and shielded columns thicken over all the plains the argive men and arunkan forces the rutulians and the old sicanians the Socranian ranks and Libetians with painted shields, they who till thy dells, O Tiber, and Numicus's sacred shore, and whose plowshare goes up and down on the Rutulian hills and the Circean headland, over whose fields of Jupiter Anxer washes, and Feronia glad in her greenwood, and where the marsh of Satyra lies black and cold Ufens wins his way along the valley bottoms and sinks into the sea. Therewithal came Camilla the Volsian, leading a train of cavalry squadron splendid with brass a warrior maiden who had never used her woman's hands to minerva's distaff or wool baskets but hardened to endure the battle shock and outstrip the winds with racing feet she might have flown across the topmost blades of unmown corn and left the tender ears unhurt as she ran or sped her way over mid-sea upborne by the swelling flood nor dipped her swift feet in the water all the people pour from house and field and mothers crowd to wander and gaze at her as she goes in rapturous astonishment to the royal luster of purple that drapes her smooth shoulders at the clasp of gold that intertwines her tresses at the lycian quiver she carries in the pastoral myrtle shaft topped with steel end of section fourteen